six of Maimonides, the book of pledging. I call it the book of expression, right? And here we have a concept called an oath and a vow. Shavua and neder. Now in English these two terms might be synonymous, but in Hebrew there are two separate concepts. An oath, a shavua, is on the person, right? I am forbidden to eat apples. And a vow is on the object. Apples are forbidden to me. So we begin, the Rambam says, not to swear falsely in God's name, right? We have the Ten Commandments, right? Do not take God's name in vain. I'm sure you remember Perry Mason, when the guy comes to the witness court, put your hand on the Bible, raise your right hand. You swear, tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me, right, right? Did you murder your wife? No, not me. <laughs> Did you embezzle a million dollars in your business? Oh, no, not me. <laughs> Do you believe the guy? <laughs> Do you believe the guy? Tell me. <laughs> but he put his hand on the Bible, right, right? <laughs> So you don't believe him anyway. Why bother making him put his hand on the Bible? You don't believe him anyway. <laughs> and the answer to that is, there was once a time when even the non-Jews were very much afraid of perjury. They would not put their hands on the Bible if they didn't say a statement that wasn't true. Putting your hands on the Bible means you're taking God as a witness that what you're saying is true. And that was very heavy at one time. Today, not so much anymore, all right? But there was a time, and the rabbis tell us that when God said the third commandment, do not take my name in vain, the entire world trembled and all the non-Jews heard it. Therefore, an oath is serious, even in the non-Jewish world, until, until recently, right, right? Do not take God's name in vain, right? If I swear this table is a chair, I'm swearing falsely. If I swear this table is a table, I'm taking God's name in vain. Do not deny it when something of value is left in your possession. Swear falsely. Sometimes you have to swear by God's name to confirm the truth. When the courts say you have to swear, you have to swear, right? And some people would rather pay the money than swear, right, right, right? There was a case of a rabbi that was accused falsely, right? And he didn't want to swear, but they said, if you don't, if you don't swear, if you pay the money, they'll say that you, that you really stole the money, right? right? It'll be a bad name for the rabbi. So he, they made him swear. By the way, when you don't have to, when you go for a passport, they tell you to take a swear. Or when the army, you, have, you say, I affirm. I affirm means I promise, but it's not an oath. Even the Israeli soldiers, when they make the, 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 the oath, when they take their oath, for the religious soldiers, instead of saying, I need mishpa, which means I swear, they say, I need matzir, I affirm. And then we come to vows, to fulfill what was uttered and do with a vow. So what's the difference if the uh, prohibition is on the person or on the object? The difference is when a person makes a vow or an oath, that contradicts the Torah. At Sinai, the entire Jewish people accepted unto themselves an oath to keep the Torah. We're under oath, right? And that oath applied to all future generations, all future converts. We're all under oath. So if I take an oath, I will not sit in the sukkah on sukkot. I will not wear tefillin. It's not valid, because I'm already under oath. But a vow on the object, if I say these tefillin are forbidden to me, then these tefillin are forbidden to me. This sukkah is forbidden to me. The Torah doesn't have to wear this sukkah, I have to wear these tefillin, this sukkah, all right? But what if I say all tefillin are forbidden to me, all sukkot are forbidden to me, then I'm like someone that doesn't have, a t- doesn't have tefillin. All tefillin are forbidden to me. I can't wear tefillin. I don't, have, I don't have tefillin. I don't have a sukkah. Of course, since I have an obligation to wear tefillin and to sit in a sukkah, I have to take off the vow. I have to take it off. But until I take it off, it's still considered a vow. Now, how do you take off a vow or an oath? You go to an expert, Yochid Mumche, or to three laymen, and they find for you an Pesach Habata, an opening of regret. Had I known when I made the vow this is going to happen, I never would have made the vow. I made a vow, I'm not going to eat apples. My grandma made an apple pie. If I made an apple pie, she'd be very, very insulted. If I would have known when I made the vow, she made an apple pie, I never would have made the vow. Think in our introduction, we talked about Rabbi Kiva. Do you remember that? Did we talk about that in the introduction? There's a story in the Talmud of Rabbi Akiva, and he was an ignoramus, let's just say in short. And he married the woman, and her father was a very rich man, but he made a vow that my daughter should not have any benefit from my, from my, from my possessions because she married an ignoramus, right? And then he became the great Rabbi Akiva, right? And the father-in-law wanted to take off his vow. He felt very bad. 24 years his daughter's living in poverty because of his vow, and he couldn't find any opening. So Rabbi Akiva came, he didn't know it was his son-in-law, and he said, uh, I want to take off my vow. Had you known when you made the vow that your son-in-law would be a great Torah scholar, would you have made the vow? Says, Even if he knew Aleph Beza would not have made the vow, he knew nothing, right? 
It's obvious out of the law. That was off, right? Comes along Tosvot, you know, on, the, on every page of Talmud, we have two commentaries. We have Rashi and we have Tosvot. Rashi explains the text. And Tosvot acts contradictions. You know, the, the, the Talmud is over 20 volumes. Every single statement in the Talmud has to be consistent with every other statement. There can be no contradictions. So every page of Talmud talks about, how can you make the statement here, but three pages before, nine pages later, two books before, three books later, says this, contradiction, 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 right? So you have to deal with it. Either it's an argument, that's one opinion, that's the other opinion, or it's a different case. Tosvot, that's a contradiction. The law of taking off vows is only if the information at, you could have known at the time. You just didn't know. I couldn't know my grandma made apple pie. I could have called those. Grandma was apple, apple pie. I didn't know, but I could have. That means it was a mistake. But if it was information that you could not have known at the time, it's not, you can't take off a vow with it. For example, I made a vow I'm not going to have any benefit from Jack. The day after I made the vow, Jack decided he's going to be a scribe, and he writes a Torah scroll. Ten years later, I'm passing by a synagogue, Shabbos afternoon. They're reading the Torah in the afternoon for Mincha. I want to hear reading the Torah. I said, you can't hear reading the Torah. That Torah scroll was written by Jack. And you made a vow. You're not going to have any benefit from Jack. I said, oh, yeah? I take three guys. If I would have known when I made the vow, that Jack's going to be a scribe and write a Torah scroll. And I want to hear reading the Torah. And I would have made it. No good. Because at the time when you made the vow, Jack wasn't even thinking of being a scribe. It was only afterwards, right? So you could not have known at the time. So how could Rabbi Kiva take off this rabbi, this guy's vow? He could not have known at the time. He'd be a great scholar. And Tosas has an answer which is relevant to every one of us. What's the answer? When someone goes to yeshiva, it's assumed he's going to be a great scholar. His mother told him, but daddy, he's going to Rosh Hashanah. He's going to learn Torah. <laughs> Once he knew he's going to yeshiva, the normal way of those who come to yeshiva is they become great scholars. So it's not considered something he could not have known. So it's similar, you know, the tshuva process is very similar to taking off a vow. The first thing we say on Yom Kippur is kol nidre, take off our vows, right, right? What's tshuva? If I would have known when I did that act that Hashem is watching me, that it's so severe, that it's such a terrible punishment, I never would have done it, right? Tshuva takes off the act that we did, similar to the way we take off a vow with an opening. Now women, the Torah makes it a little bit easier because women are more prone to make vows than men. They're always taking diets and all kinds of things, right? So a girl, a vow is valid from a year before bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. A girl from the age of 11, a boy from the age of 12, if they're aware of what they're saying, right? We have to make sure they know what they're saying, but if they're aware of what they're saying, their vow is valid, they have to keep it. But a girl is under her father's wings until the age of 12 and a half. Even though she's a bat mitzvah at 12, until 12 and a half, the father can still marry her off, and there's certain laws that apply that the father can do, and the father can take off her vow when he hears it, and just says, I don't want it, and it's no vow, all right? But it has to be the day that he hears it. It doesn't matter when she made the vow. She made the vow a year before. It doesn't matter. When he hears it until sunset. If he hears it at night, he has all night and all, all day. He hears it in the morning, all day. A minute before sunset, he's got one minute. Right? He's got to take it off, right? And if he doesn't take it off, it becomes valid. He can't take it off after that. Right? And a husband has the right to take off his wife's vows. Right? right? It has to be a vow that is relevant to him, right? Between him and between her, or something which is painful for her. I'm not going to take showers, I'm not going to wear perfume, I'm not going to wear makeup, things like that, which are relevant to him. And the day he hears it, he takes it off. Okay. Now we have a uh, specific kind of a vow, which is called the Nazir, a Nazarite. Right? Don't confuse that with the word Nazarene, which means the guy from Nazareth, right? right? Uh, no connection whatsoever, right? Because Nazarite and Nazarene may sound similar in English, but in Hebrew, that's Nazaret with a tzaddik, and that's Nazir with a Zion. Totally two different words. No connection whatsoever. What's a Nazir? A Nazir is someone who can accept upon himself for a limited period of time, generally for 30 days, but it can be longer. Three things. Not to drink wine or any, any, uh, any drab, anything grape. Not grapes, raisins, anything. Any grape juice, nothing. Nothing to do with grapes. Right? That's the idea of physical pleasure. Right? right? You can eat ice cream. You can have other, you know, but, but no wine, right? You can drink beer, you can drink schnapps, right? But no wine. <laughs> then he cannot contaminate the dead bodies, even a close relative. You know, a Kohen cannot contend, contend the funeral, cannot be under the same roof as the dead body, but only, but, it, the, but the exception is a close relative. A Kohen may attend the funeral of a close relative, father, mother, brother, sister, son, daughter, wife. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, we don't have today, he could not even attend the funeral of a close relative because he always had to be in, and, you know, in touch with God, if you, contem- if you contaminate to a dead body, you've got to go through a purification process, right? And the Nazarite cannot contaminate even to a close relative. That means for a limited period of time, any Jew can accept upon himself the holiness of a high priest. Right? Lord, he, wants to, he wants to grow in spirituality. That's the idea behind it, right? And the third thing is he cannot cut his hair. You know the story of Samson? 
Samson was a Nazarite from conception, right? An angel appeared to his mother and said, you're going to be pregnant. While you're pregnant, you can't drink wine because the baby's a Nazarite from conception, right? And then Samson couldn't cut his hair. He had very long hair, right, right? Story of the Delilah and she had cut his hair. He lost his strength, right? Now, um, generally, 30 days. But if in that period you contaminated to a dead body, someone dropped dead right in front of you, right? So you have to start all over again. You have to shave your hair. By the way, at the end, at the end of the period, the glass has to shave all his hair off with a razor, with a razor. The beard pays everything, right, right? You find three examples of that in the Torah. We have the uh, this leper, after his uh, purification process, to shave all his hair off. The Nazarite. And the third one is, you know, Adam? Adam, what's the third one? What's the third one? You know the third one? The Levites, in their induction ceremonies, have to shave all the hair off, right? What's the common denominator? So Rabbi Hirsch explains the common denominator is hair is a separation between a person and their environment, right? If you have long hair and you fall on your head, you know, it cushions your, it cushions your fall, right, right, right? When a Nazarite is separated from his society, he grows his hair long, right? When the, when the leper is outside of the camp, he has to grow his hair long, right, right? How do you symbolize coming back into society? Taking away the separation, shaving off your hair. And the Levites have to represent the Jewish people in the temple. They have to be one with the people. How do you symbolize being one with the people? By taking off your hair, right, right? By taking away the separation, right? And here we have an example of a positive overrides a negative. We're not allowed to cut our, our, our beard with a with razor. You're not allowed to cut your pays off, right? But here the Torah says you can, right? And a, 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 a positive overrides a negative, right? Now, the Nazarite is called holy. He's holy to Hashem. But one of the sacrifices he brings is a sin offering, all right? Why does he bring a sin offering? What's his sin, right? Similarly, we find a woman who has, gave birth also has to bring a sin offering. Is it a sin to have a baby? Right? What's a sin, right? So by the women, by the childbirth, the rabbis say, possibly when she was in childbirth, so much pain, you know, babies, having babies is very painful. <laughs> we always, they say, if men had babies, everybody only have one. <laughs> we can't take pain. Women can take pain more, right? And, uh, and maybe during the childbirth, she, was, she made an oath. I'm not going back to my husband. No more babies, that's it. No more, right, right? right? She didn't really mean it, right, right? She might have said something improper or thought something improper, so the, the sin offering atones for that. But by the Nazarite, the rabbis say, you know why he brings a sin offering? Because he abstains from pleasure in this world. He abstains from wine. Wine is a positive thing, right? In, a, in a moderation. All right, 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 right. We're not talking about getting drunk, all right, right? We, we, we make kiddush on wine, we drink wine, we make a lechayim, right, 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 right. I once had guests at my house, and my children were little, and I gave them wine from the kiddush. You're giving minors intoxicating beverages, right, right? <laughs> On the contrary, until very recently, there were no Jewish alcoholics. You know why? Because we always gave them wine to drink. They always had wine. They always had it was never forbidden fruit in the secular world. Until you're 18, you can't touch it. Then you get drunk. <laughs> so the Torah, you, pro you, you prohibited yourself from wine. Do, do, what do you think, man? Do you think the Torah prohibits, prohibits enough things? <laughs> enough things? Not enough things. Not, too many things. Right? <laughs> and yet this Nazarite wanted to admit something. The Torah wants to even enjoy this world. We're supposed to enjoy this world within the parameters of the Torah. No cheeseburgers, right? But have you tasted mango, right? Have you had star fruit, right? Have a pomegranate. They're good. God wants. Did you, ever, did you ever see the Alps, right? Rabbi Simpson, where for the if someone never saw the Alps in Switzerland, when they come to heaven, God's going to ask you, did you see my Alps? I made it just for you to enjoy. Did you ever see it? Right? So if you say I was studying Torah in Jerusalem, you have a good excuse. Right? <laughs> Otherwise. Right? Right. So it seems, on one hand, there's a contradiction. Here it seems he's holy. Here it seems he's a sinner, right? So the answer to this contradiction, the Talmud has a story from Shimon Atzadik. Name sound familiar? Right? That's the street we're on. He's very near here, right? right? Well, Shimon Atzadik was a high priest. And he would never partake of the sacrifice of a Nazarite. Two, actually, there's a difference in the Bavli and the Shalmi. One place it says any Nazarite. One place only the Nazarite who was contaminated and had to bring a sacrifice. And the idea was, if he became contaminated and he had started all over again, he might have thought in his mind, I regret making this oath. I wanted to be a Nazarite 30 days, not 60 days, one year, not two years. There's a story in the Mishnah of a lady who was a Nazarite for, for seven years and she had to do it again, 14 years, right? Something even the third time, 21 years, right? So she could think, I don't want to do it, right? So even though he didn't formally take it off by going to a wise man and saying, if I would have known, but since he thought in his heart, I regret, so Shimon Atzadeh considered that as if he take off the oath, and therefore this, this sacrifice, is, this sacrifice is not valid, and therefore he would not eat from the sacrifice. Until it happened one time, there was a 
handsome young man from the south who came to bring the sacrifice of his Azariah, and he had long hair and beautiful hair, curly hair, right? And she went and asked him, my son, why did you become a Nazarite to shave all this beautiful hair off? He says, you know, I was a shepherd for my father down in the south, and one day I noticed my reflection in the water. You know, in the olden days, men did not look in mirrors. Did you know that? Mirrors were for women, right? Remember the story of the women from Egypt, right? <laughs> Women were women. Men did it. In fact, in Shulchan Aruch, it actually says that men should not look in mirrors. Today, we, we, we shave. Today, the custom is that we shave, we look in mirrors, right? But men didn't look in mirrors. The great rabbi, Yosef Chaim Zadifel, the chief rabbi of the old city in Jerusalem before the state, right? They once showed him a picture of himself. He looked at it, he says, looks like a real pious Jew. He had no idea of himself. He never looked in the mirror. He didn't know what he looked like, right? He didn't know what he was him. <laughs> he never looked in the mirror. You don't know, you know what he looked like. So this guy also didn't look in the mirror. But one time, he accidentally noticed his reflection in the river, and he saw how handsome he was. And he said, the Yetzara, the evil inclination come upon him. He says, go sin, you're so handsome, go sin. He said to him, evil one, wicked one, what are you so proud of? In the end, you're going to end up lunch for the worms, like well, everybody else. And the, what happens in the grave? The, the worms eat you up, right, 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 right. And he said, I will accept upon myself to be a Nazarite and shave this hair off, right? And when Shiva and heard that, he kissed him on the forehead, and he said, his sacrifice, this guy will not regret it. Even if it happened that he became contaminated, he would not regret it. He was happy to be a Nazarite. So, so that's, the answer. that's the answer to the contradiction. If the reason why you became a Nazarite, your motivation was, I'm holier than you, I'm a Nazarite, right, 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 then, it's, then you're a sinner. But if he intended, I mean, what, what's the purpose of a vow in the first place? You know, what, if it's so bad to break vows, why is the Torah saying there's vows? Vows are a tool to help me grow. People are afraid of vows. So even though, you know, I, I know this, it's also, listen, I make a vow, I will not walk on the same side of the street as McDonald's. Same side of the street as the next rated movie. <laughs> a vow is a tool to help you overcome the Yetzirah, right? But if you give in, it's worse. That's the idea. So, so he saw this guy, he really meant it seriously. When, when you gave, make a Nazarite for the sake of heaven, then it's a mitzvah, then you're holy. That's the idea. Estimated values and vows of my drink. So a person can, es- can donate the value of an object to the, to the temple or the value of a person. Now, the value of a person, we don't estimate his value on the slave market as we do by damages, right? If you damage someone, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth means, how much would the guy be worth on the slave market with one eye, with two eyes, right? That's for damages. But for estimation, the Torah gives a set amount based on gender and age, right? Men, this age bracket, women, this age bracket, and men usually have a higher value than women because they, they can usually, uh, you know, make more money, right, right? But it's interesting, when they get over 60, right, men devaluate much more than women do. And the rabbis make a pithy statement. They say, when grandma's in the house, it's a pleasure in the house. When grandpa's in the house, get out of his way. Because right? generally speaking, men, older men get more senile, right? They get in the way. Grandmother comes, she bakes, she cooks, she helps, you know, right? She does a lot of, she's very, an older woman can be very helpful in the house, but an older man, <laughs> get out of his way. Okay. Okay, now we get to book seven. Book seven is the book of seeds. The agricultural laws. The first thing is, we can't plant different seeds together. God made diversity in the world, and he wants diversity, right? We can't crossbreed, right? So within a breed itself, you can make different, you can, uh, you can breed. Uh, I want to breed a better tomato, a better, um, uh, a better uh, you know, a uh, horse, a dog. Within the, within the species, you're allowed to, but not two different species, right? Um, then there's a law, we're not allowed to work two animals together, right? Pulling a plow is the Torah says an ox and a donkey. An ox and a donkey you cannot pull together in a plow. And the oral law says it means any two animals, right? Right? Any two animals. So an ox and donkey, t- the Baladas uh, Kanim says interesting, as far as he says, the ox chews its plow, its, its cud, and the donkey doesn't. The donkey sees the ox chewing, he's eating. How come I've got what he's eating? How come he's eating? I've got to eat, right? right? You're causing pain to the ox, to the animal. All right. But, but this law applies, the oral law says, to any two animals, a llama and a camel, right? Any two animals. I think the reason is very obvious. The reason is because they don't pull the same rate, right? Remember, if you're carrying something heavy with another guy, if the other guy is the same strength as you, it's one thing. If he's much weaker than you or much stronger than you, it's much harder, right? It's not, when they're not pulling the same So two animals don't pull the same rate. That would be the reason. Again, causing pain to animals. And within this context, the Rambam also writes the thing of shotness. You can have wool and linen in the same garment, in the same garment. You can have a wool sweater and a linen shirt, that's no problem. But if in one garment you sew, it has to be sewed, right? Sewed one thread of wool and one thread of linen, you can't wear that garment, right? Which means when you buy clothes, you gotta look at the ingredients, right? You thought ingredients only for food, right? Before you buy a suit, if it says on the ingredients that this, this garment contains wool and linen, you can't buy it, right? But even if it says 100% wool, 
Hunter said, polyester, right, right? Usually, I got my jacket and jackets. You have, even if it's polyester, the, under the collar, it usually has wool there, right? So if the pockets or the buttons or the lining was sewn on with linen thread, you have wool and linen, the same garment, you can't wear it. So we have laboratories there that check it, Chutnis Laboratories. This was started by a man named uh, Josef Rosenblum, Rosenblum, I forgot his name, Rosenblum, something like that. He was a Holocaust survivor, right? And he was a tailor in Europe before the war. And in Europe, before the war, when you wanted a suit made, you went to a tailor, right? In Israel also years ago, when I got married here, 33 years ago, right? They didn't have ready-made suits over here in America. They didn't have, you had to go to a tailor, and he would take your measurements, and he would, you'd pick out the, 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 the material you wanted, and he'd sew you a suit, all right? So you went to a religious tailor. He made sure not to make wool and linen. But when you buy ready-made suits, right, especially in Hong Kong or you know, over in the Far East, they might have linen in it, right, right? So you take it to the laboratory. They have your made shower of a laboratory. And he takes samples from the pockets and from the buttons and from the lining, and he puts it under a microscope, and he can tell if it's linen. So then he can take it out, remove it, and put in cotton instead, right? If the material itself is wool and linen, there's nothing you can do about it, right, right? What's the idea of wool and linen together? So wool is a lamb, that's the animal world, and linen is flax, that's the plant world. The plant world and the animal world are two separate things, right? I always tell my students, what's the difference between a plant and an animal? What do plants do all day? Don't say vegetate, right? <laughs> tell me, what do plants do all day? No, that's not true. They, they take in carbon dioxide, right? They photosynthesize. I mean, they grow. They, f- they grow, right? But before they grow, they do something first. Before they grow, what do they have to do first? Before they grow? They have to take nourishment from the ground. They put down roots, right? A seed germinates. It puts down roots, and it takes nourishment. From the it eats, and it grows. It eats, and it grows. All day long. You know what they do? They eat, and they grow. They eat and reproduce, right? Now, animals are on a higher level than plants, right? Animals have a brain. They can think. Animals can walk around, right? What do animals think about? Eating food and females, right? right? What do they walk around to get? <laughs> food and females. An animal is a walking, thinking plant, right? right? <laughs> That's why the animal has its head on the same level as its body, because it thinks about its body, right, right? Human beings stand up straight. Our heads are above our bodies. That means we're supposed to think about something higher than just our bodies. I know some people don't, right? right? <laughs> supposed to think about something higher than our bodies. That's, that's why human beings stand up straight. We're supposed to think about something higher than our bodies, right, right? You know, you, oh, what's, what's the next question I always get? What about giraffes? What about giraffes? <laughs> giraffes have four legs. They just have a long neck to reach the food on top of them. If you want to imitate an ape, what do you do? <laughs> so wool is the plant world, is the animal world, and linen is the plant world. You have to separate between the two. That's the idea. You can't have both in the same garment. That's shotness, right? Then we have section two is gifts to the poor, right? So in temple times, right, when you harvest your field, thank you, in ag- agricultural society, right, the first thing you did was you left one corner for the poor. That was called the peya. Peya, not the long peyas, but peya, the corner. The corner of the beer, the corner of the... Right? And the poor could either divide it equally if they wanted to, or if there were... If there many of them, they could just grab, free for all, grab as much as you want, whatever you, grab, whatever you grab, that was yours. That was the peya. Then we have leket v'shikha. When you cut the grain, so in the olden days, before they had combines, right? You would cut the... You would take a scythe or a sickle and cut the grain, and then you would tie it for a bundle, and t- cut another one, tie it, and then you come back and gather up all your, your bundles, right? If when you cut the grain, one or two grains fell to the floor, you had to leave it for the poor. You couldn't pick it up. Three or more, you could pick it up. And when you came back to gather your bundles, if you forgot one or two behind you, you had to leave it for the poor. Three or more, you go back. And the poor would follow, they were called the gleaners, we have in the book of Ruth a description of it, and they would follow after the harvesters, and they would pick up whatever they left. I'm sorry, leave them more, right? That was how you gave to the poor. Same thing with vineyard, if they're on... Uh, unformed clusters of grapes, you have to leave it for the poor. Um, then we have the tithes of the poor. We'll talk about that when we get about the tithes. And then we get to the next section about tithes. Tithes of the poor, right? Um, to give tzedakah. Not to withhold tzedakah. It's a mitzvah to give tzedakah. Now we come, now we come to truma and maiseh. What's truma and maiseh, right? So, outside of Israel, you eat fresh fruits and vegetables. They're all kosher. Except for the part of the bug, right? What's worth it? What's worse than biting into an apple, biting a worm? Half a worm, right? But in Israel, any produce that grows in Israel, not only if, if, if you're not in Israel, in America, but, uh, Jaffa oranges, any produce that grows in Israel, there's a prohibition called tevel. Tevel means untithe, right? Today it applies rabbinically, probably, but still a prohibition. So first I'll explain to you how it worked in temple times, then we'll see how it works today, right? 
when you harvest your field, you have to give truma to the Kohen. How much was truma? Truma means a separation. The Torah law is no amount. Torah law, no amount. One grain is enough, the Torah law. The rabbi said you give one fiftieth, one sixtieth, one fortieth. Depending on your general, an average person, one out of fifty. If you're generous, one out of sixty, uh, one out of forty. If you're cheap, one out of sixty, right, right? And that goes to the Kohen, and that can only be eaten by the Kohen and his family. His wife, his children, his sons, his daughters, his non Jewish slave is part of the family, his Jewish slave or not. <laughs> He's not part of the family. <laughs> then you had to give a tenth to the Levite. Understand, the Kohen and Levites did not own property, right? They, they lived off these, these generations, the generosity of the people. They studied Torah. They were the yeshiva students, right? right? The Levite got a tenth. That means you have 100 acres of grain. You got to take 10 acres of that grain and give it to a Levite. And once the Levite gets it, he can, anyone can eat it. That's, that's, not, that's not limited to Levite's family. Anyone can eat that. But the Levite has to take a tenth of what he gets and give it to the Kohen. So we had 100 acres, right? You gave a, you, after, you, after you gave the 140th, 150, 160 of the Kohen, you have 100 acres. Ten acres go to the Levite, and he's got to take one acre of that and give it to the Kohen. That's called Trumas Meiser, the Truma of the Meiser. And that belonged to the Kohen again. Only the Kohen and his family could eat it. But you're not finished yet. So you had 100 acres, now you have 90 acres, right, right? You got to have a second tithe. Now, we have a seven-year cycle. The seventh year is sabbatical year when there's no tithes, right? So the first and second and third and fourth year of the cycle, the second tithe is eaten by the owner in Jerusalem. It means you take... Out of 90 acres, you take nine, nine acres of grain, and you got to bring it to Jerusalem and eat it with your family. Now, if it's too difficult to transport so much grain to Jerusalem, you can redeem it on money. You take coins, the same value of those nine acres, and you transfer the holiness from the grain to the coins. Now you can eat the grain normally, right? And take those coins to Jerusalem. With those coins, you buy food, food products, right? Food products that you can eat. And you eat it in Jerusalem with purity and holiness. Jerusalem in temple times was a center of spirituality, right? You'd see the Kohanim, you'd see the Beisam Mikdash, right? This would be a tremendous spiritual high for, the, for, the, for every family that had to come to eat this, the, the, the Jewish Meiser, the, the Meiser Sheni, called Meiser Sheni, second tithe in Jerusalem. The third and sixth year of the cycle, that second tithe was given to the poor. That was given to the poor. As we had Meiser Ani, the poor man. Okay, that was in temple times. In modern times, there's a number of problems. One problem is we don't know for sure who a Kohen or a Levi is, right, right? We don't know for, uh, you know, when Ellis Island, people got in there, the guy couldn't, couldn't pronounce his, his Polish names, so they gave him Kohen and Levi, Kohen and Levi, right? Many people in Kohen are not Kohens, right? We don't know for sure who a Kohen is, right? So if someone has a tradition in his family is a Kohen, we call him up to the Torah, right? We honor him with Benji, right? Uh, the big problem with today is Pidyan Ben. When you redeem your firstborn, you have to find a Kohen, right? So you're not sure what Cohen is. You have to try to best, best. There's a family called Rappaport that has a yichus. They have lineage. They find the Rappaport. He's a Cohen. <laughs> they have more lean, They're more sure. They're, they're more sure they're Cohen than other Cohen because they have a lineage that goes all the way back. In any case, in any case, since we don't know for sure what Cohen is, we can't give the truma to a Cohen, right? So but we have to separate it, or it's tevel, right? You have to separate it and throw it away, right? What goes to the Levite, we can eat. But again, we don't know what a Levite is, so we separate it. We say, if, if you can prove you're a Levite, we'll give it to you. If you can't prove it, I can keep it. Right, right, right? So we start off with the truma. As I said, from Torah law, one grain is enough. The rabbi said, 150 is six. That's when you give it to the Kohen. Since we're not giving it to the Kohen anyway, so we go back to Torah law. You take up one grain, you have 100 acres of grain, one grain, you say, that's the truma. And that you have to throw away. You can't eat it. Right? Then you say, a tenth of this. Produce. If we talk about 100 acres, it's 10 acres. You have to designate where it is. 10 acres on the northern part of the field. Or even if, you, if you're tithing one, one orange, a tenth of the orange on the top of the orange, right, right? That is designated to be the tithe for the Levite. And then since I'm not giving it to the Levite, I've got to take a tenth of that in, for the Kohen. And a tenth of that. I said 10 acres on the northern part of the field should be the Levite. One acre is for the Trumas Mice that goes to the Kohen. All right? A tenth of this orange should be to the Levite. And a, a one hundredth, in other words, it's a hundredth. One acre out of a hundred acres. We're dealing with a hundredth of the, of the produce, right? And that cannot be eaten. That must be thrown out, right? In an honorable way. If you're throwing out an orange, you put wrap it in something, right? Right? Have to give it. That cannot be eaten. If you, so in other words, a kibbutz that keeps these laws has to throw away a hundredth of their produce, which could be a lot if you're dealing with a big area with a lot of the, a lot of fields. It could be a lot of a lot of fruit, but it has to throw it out. That cannot be eaten. Now, the second tithe. No, 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 there's a tithe that goes to the Levite. If someone can prove he's a Levite, you have to give it to him. If he's, someone, since someone can prove they're a Levite, you can eat it. No, anyone, anyone can eat that, right? You just have to separate it. If you don't separate it, it's temple. Then in the first and second and third and fourth, and the fourth and fifth years, 
The second tithe, you have to des designate. On the southern part of the field, nine acres should be the second tithe. Am I right? Or the bottom of the orange, uh, the, uh, uh, nine tenths should be the, should be, should be the second tithe. And we redeem it. So since today we're not going to eat in Jerusalem anyway, you redeem it out a coin, even one pruta, the smallest coin, right? And that coin you can throw out, all right? It gets complicated if uh, there's a pruta hamur. I won't go into the details now. It gets a little complicated if you're dealing with body temples, who is temple for sure, right? Now, if you're not sure that this was really tithe, right? Maybe it was tithe already. For example, the chief rabbinate officially tithes all the produce in Israel. You know, anything you buy in the marketplace was officially tithed by the chief rabbinate, right? We don't depend on that. Because it's very, very lenient. You know, uh, non-religious kibbutz is not going to want to throw away uh, 10 acres of rain, right? So they come on to many leniencies, right, right, right? So we don't depend on that. We have a better heksher. But that's, make sure that, you know, our, our, all of you own the religious neighborhoods, all the vegetable stores have a sign, the tithe was taken off, right, right? But since it's possible that they tithed it, right? We're not saying for sure they did, right, right, right? So any second tithe is a suffix. So if I'm taking a tithe out of question, just in case, the second tithe, I can say, uh, prove, uh, it's, it's, it's a question, I can eat it, right? I don't have to give it to, I, 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 no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That comes to the, well, I'm sorry, uh, um, that, that refers to the, to the poor man. I, I, I mixed up. The second tithe, you got to redeem on a coin, and you throw away the coin, right, right? One pruta. I don't know, it depends on the value of silver, but usually for one shekel, you can redeem many times, and then you can take that shekel and, and, and put it onto a ten agarot. And throw, 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 it's not an expensive deal. Throw away the ten agarot. It's not an expensive deal. Right, right, right. The third and the sixth year, that second tithe has to be given to a poor man. Now, can a poor man prove he's a poor man? Yes, right, right. You show you his bank account, right, right, right. Here you have a problem. If I have 10 acres, 100 acres, I have to give the nine acres to a poor man. That's a lot of grain, right, 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 right. So I said, if it's, I'm tithing out of question, just in case. I tell the poor man, if you can prove it wasn't, maybe the rabbit and prize it, right? If you can prove it wasn't tithing, they'll give it to you. Otherwise, I can keep it, right, right? But if you know for sure it wasn't tithing, you have a field, you have a, you have a vineyard, whatever it is, right, right? So you got to give it to a poor man. Now, you say, the poor man, what do you need? Nine acres of grain. You can't do it. I'll give you as much as you need, right, right? And the rest, I'll give it to you, and you'll sell it back to me at the price of a dollar an acre, okay? Right? You agree? And if you don't agree, what do I do? I'll find another poor man that will. <laughs> So somebody agrees, right? I can, I, once I've given it to the poor man, I feel my obligation, right, right? Now I can, I, I can get it back from you. Yeah, 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 poor man, he can give it back to me, right, right? You don't have to, you don't have to keep it. There's ways to do it. Or today, the, what they do generally is they, 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 they take the amount and they give it to an organization that gives to the poor, right? They, 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 there's ways to, to, you know, it shouldn't be so expensive. Um, you know, the Chazoni said that a yeshiva student who doesn't have his own money is considered a poor man, right? The olden days, all these Israeli yeshiva students that didn't have their own bank accounts, you know, they didn't have their own money. They just found their parents, so you can give them the mice around here, right, 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 right. When I was yeshiva years ago, we, we did that also. They found an American yeshiva student. He's got money in the bank. <laughs> He's not a poor man, right? You can't give it to him, right? right. It was Shabbos. We remember, it was Shabbos once, and we gave it to them. They told us that since he separated, it's not my, it's not Muxa. It's have to uh, promise you give it to the poor afterwards. Okay. Uh, so we went over Trubas and Maestris. And the second tithe. Now, if you didn't give the tithe, you could put it away. You don't have to give. Uh, you could put it away and save it for three years. The third year, you have to take it out of your house. We have a parsha of the chumash and parsha of kisava. Right, we're coming to the chumash right soon. Right, kisava. That the year of the miser. The third year, you got to take it out of your house. Whatever you saved up and you didn't give, you got to take it out of your house. It's parsha of kisava. You got to say it, make a proclamation. Interesting proclamation, right? We familiar with us from the Seder, right? When you come to the land, so the first thing is the first fruits, right? You have to take the first fruits. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's also one in Bikurim, right? Yeah. You worked so hard on your vineyard. You worked so hard on your, on your olive grove, on your, uh, your dates, your figs, right? The first fruit is ripe in the season. You see your first ripe grape. What are you tempted to do? Eat it, right? No, you can't eat it. Got to put a red string on it to know it was the first fruit. And when it gets bigger, got to take it to the Kohen. You have to make a procession and give it to Jerusalem. The first fruits are given to the Kohen, right? And then it says, when you finish tithing all the grain, this is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter uh, 26, verse 12, right? Uh, and the third year, the year of the tithe. That means we have to take it. And you should give it to the Levite. That's the second tithe, right? The stranger, the widow, and the, and, 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 and the widow. That's, the, uh, that's the, the tithe that goes to the, to the poor, right? And eat it in your gates. That's the second tithe, right? The, what you gave to the coin, you have to give to the coin right away, right? right? But what you have to give to the Levite, what you have to start to eat in Jerusalem with the poor, you can save it up the third year. You've got to take it out of your house, right? And you've got to say a proclamation. I've taken the holy out of the house. I gave it to the Levite, right? I didn't I break your laws, right? right? I did everything you commanded me, right? I didn't break your mitzvahs. I didn't forget. Isn't that a little bit redundant? 
I didn't break any of your commandments and I didn't forget. You know what it means? I didn't forget you. Person can do all the mitzvahs and forget about God. <laughs> With an old man in the back of the shul. And the rabbi was talking about the Almighty, the Almighty, the Almighty. Says, Don't talk so much about God. And let's dive it already. Right? <laughs> let's dive it. We just said it. Nothing to do with God. <laughs> Nothing to do with God. All right? Right? Look down from your holy place in heaven and bless your people Israel and the land which you've given us, flowing with milk and honey. Okay. So that's the, the proclamation you make when you, you give the tithes. Here we have first fruits, we just mentioned, right? Uh, now, the Torah designates many things for the Kohen. The idea behind it is to remember God. Whatever God gives you, you have to give a portion to God, right? And remember God. The Kohen is a representative of God. So when you slaughter an animal, you've got to give. The shoulder, cheeks, and stomach to the Kohen. It's not the plight today. When you shear the sheep, the first shear goes to the, goes to the Kohen, right? And we have challah, right? You know what challah is, Ben? You know what challah is? Don't tell me the food we read, the bread we eat on Shabbos, right? Challah is when you break bread, you've got to take a little piece and temple times give it to the Kohen. Today we, we burn it. This, this applies even to chutzlaris, right? In chutzlaris, when you bake bread, you take, you know, I have a theory. Why do we call the Shabbos bread challah? Why do we call the Shabbos bread challah? I have a theory. It's my own theory. Um, you see, in the olden days, they would bake their own bread. You only take challah off if there's a certain minimum amount. So on the weekdays, they would bake bread. They would, reach, they would make smaller amounts. There wasn't enough to challah. When they baked the bread for Shabbos, they'd make a big amount, and they take off the challah. So challah, this is the bread that they took the challah off. That's what we call the challah. <laughs> That's my theory. <laughs> In any case, so you have to give it to the Kohen, the first shearing, the firstborn son you have to redeem, right? Firstborn donkey, right? The only thing we find firstborn kosher animal has to be given to the Kohen, right? We can't, this, is, this is a problem today, a problem today, right? Because the Kohen, uh, we don't know what Kohen is. He can give it to a Kohen, it has to be sacrificed. They don't sacrifice today, right? right? So a firstborn kosher animal, right? It's very problematic. You have to hold on to it until it has a blemish, right? You can't eat it, right? Um, so therefore, the, because of that problem, they usually get around it. If you have a Jewish farmer that has a cow that's giving birth the first time, they sell it to a non-Jew until after it gives birth. That way it gets around the problem. Right, 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 right. Um, and then you have a donkey, right? The only uh, uh, specific thing that a non-kosher animal has. Since the donkeys were the beast of burden, and they helped us take the loot out of Egypt, right, right? So if you have a firstborn donkey, the Torah says, redeem it with a sheep and give the sheep to a coin, right? This does apply today. Every once in a while, they have, we have a pigeon petach amor. They have a big, big ceremony, and they bring in the donkey with all the ornaments on it. You know, when you make a pigeon a bed, you put ornaments on the baby, so they put ornaments on the donkey, right, right? And they redeem it with the sheep. Give it to the Kohen. And the Torah says, if you don't redeem it, you got to break the neck of the donkey. You can't have any benefit. If you don't give it to the Kohen, you can't have any benefit from it. And now we come to the one mitzvah in the Torah that all the college professors keep. What's that? The sabbatical! <laughs> Every seven years, take a year off. Sabbatical, right, right? And this law is one of the strongest proofs of the divinity of the Torah. This is the divinity of the Torah, this law. Every seven years, right, we can add out any agricultural, uh, what's it called, um, activity in the land of Israel. No planting, no plowing, no, you know, no harvesting in the normal manner, right? Now, we know there's such a thing called crop rotation, right? Right. Ben, we're talking about the one mitzvah all the college professors keep. You know what that one is? What's the one mitzvah? The sabbatical, right? <laughs> Every seven years, they take a year off. Right, right. Every seven years, no agricultural activity is permitted in the land of Israel. No plowing, no planting, no harvesting, right, right? So this, I say, is one of the biggest evidences of the divinity of the Torah. Because there's such a thing as crop rotation, right? If you plant the same thing every year, you deplete the minerals, right, right? It doesn't grow anymore. But no one should plant in the entire country for an entire year. If we were the committee to write the Bible, and someone suggested we should write that in our Bible, no one plants all year, would you vote for that? I mean, no, what would happen in America if nobody planted for a whole year? There'd be riots. In India, people would starve, right, right? Probably not, actually. Why? Because they overproduce anyway, so... All right, for a whole year? No, we plant for a whole year, but, anyway. but, but the price would go pretty high. <laughs> the price would go high. When the gas went up, there were riots. <laughs> anyway, um, but say for some strange reason, the community decided they're going to write that in the Bible. They're going to write in the Bible that no one plants for a whole year. Comes a question. What do we tell the people? What do we do in the seventh year, right, right? We didn't plant, right, right? What would be the logical answer to that question? The logical answer, what would it be? Save up. You know the story of Joseph in Egypt, right? You had seven years of plenty and seven years of a famine, right? And he saved up every year, right? And one guy gets up at the committee and says, tell the people, don't bother saving up. We, the committee, guarantee 
that every sixth year you'll have a bumper crop. And that bumper crop will last you for the sixth year, the seventh year, the eighth year, and the jubilee year. You have two years in a row, even the ninth year, right? Would you vote for that? I mean, does that make any sense? Is that logical? You know, if you planted six years in a row, what year are the minerals the most depleted? The sixth year, right? 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 So well, is it logical? That's going to be the year when they make the bumper crop? And yet the Torah says, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, Bahar, when it talks about the concept of, Levi- of the sabbatical year, and it says on, in verse, uh, verse 20, in chapter 25 of Leviticus, right, if you will say, what will we eat in the seventh year? We didn't plant, we didn't gather our grain, right? Commentaries say, if you won't ask the question, then you won't have any problem. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to get without it. You know, what I mean? you'll eat a little bit, you'll be full. Right, right? No problem. When they ate a little bit of the of the showbread, they were full already. Right? God can make a miracle. Right, right, right. But if you ask, you want to know on a, on a, on a physical way, in a natural way, I will command my blessing to you in the sixth year, and it will make grain for three years. You plant in the eighth year, and you'll eat from the old grain until the ninth year, until the grain comes. Right? Wow. Right. That's called we call the genius proof. A person would never write that. Only God could write that. All right, right. Another example, so I'm mentioning genius proof, I'm mentioning another example of this we find in the book of Exodus is a mitzvah pilgrimage. Three times a year, or every adult male has to come to Jerusalem, right? For a week of Passover, a week of Sukkot, and a day of Shuas, right? What's going to happen to my kibbutz on the Syrian border, right? Imagine today. All the soldiers, all the border guards, all the policemen, they all come to Jerusalem for a whole week of Passover. Have a great time. Come back to the, the kibbutz on the Syrian border. What do you think you'll find? <laughs> Ramadan, right? The Arabs will be there. <laughs> and we were always surrounded by enemies, right? If you were a member of the committee, would you write that in the Bible? Wouldn't it be smarter to say, a third come on holiday, a third come on second holiday, a third come on right, right? And yet, what does the Torah say in the book of Exodus? The Torah says in the book of Exodus, Parashat Kisisa says, this is on chapter 20, 34, verse 24, 34, 24, when I will, I will, I will uh, what does it say? I will banish nations before you. I will bo- broaden your borders. No man will covet your land when you come to see the face of God three times a year. The committee guarantees no one will covet your land. Right, 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 right. So did they keep the sabbatical year? We know they kept the sabbatical year. Right? We know, even though when they didn't keep it, right? The 70 years of the, the Babylonian exile corresponds to the 70 sabbatical year and jubilee years that they didn't keep. Right? Then we have the jubilee year. Every 50 years, right? Jubilee Yovel means the word shofar. They blow the shofar on Yom Kippur, right? Yom Kippur, we blow it on Yom Kippur, right? Proclaim liberty throughout the land and all the inhabitants thereof. Where does it say that? Anybody know? No Americans here, right? <laughs> liberty Bell. I mean, to Philadelphia, right? You know, if you go to Philadelphia, here in Jerusalem, there's a Liberty Bell Park where they have a replica of the Liberty Bell. It was cracked. And the first time they rang it, it cracked, right? right? And it says on it, where does that quotation come from? The book of Leviticus, right? What does it mean? What's it referring to? What is it referring to? So we know that someone can sell himself as an indentured servant, Evid Ivory, for six years. Man can't support his family, or he stole, and he doesn't have any money, and the courts sell him, right? For six years, he's got to work, and the money goes to pay back his debt. The seventh year, he goes out free. What if he likes the life of subordination? He doesn't have to make decisions. He doesn't want to go out, right? He has a non-Jewish slave girl, has a wife, which he has to lose. If he goes out, he has to leave her. I like it. I want to stay here. The Torah says, put a hole in his ear by the doorpost. Right? Why by the doorpost? Remember, at, in Egypt, we ate the Passover sacrifice where we, where we put the blood on the doorpost, right? At Sinai, God said, you're my servants. And you want to be a slave? You weren't listening well at Sinai. Put a hole in his ear. Right, right, right? The first time he sold himself, we don't blame him. He didn't have any money. He couldn't support himself. Uh, the court sold him, right, right? But now you have an option to go free, and you prefer to be a slave? You weren't listening well at Sinai, right? Put a hole in his ear, and it says in the book of Exodus, and he's a slave forever. But in the book of Leviticus, it modifies that. What does it mean forever? It doesn't mean forever. It means until the jubilee year. The jubilee year comes, he goes out free. He's got to come out. Another thing is, when we went into the land of Israel, so the land was divided among all the tribes, and every tribe got a portion, and every family got a plot, got a field. And that field was not supposed to be sold. You're supposed to keep it in the family, inherit it to your children, right? But if a guy was very poor, and he had no choice, and he sold his field, right, right? When it came to Jubilee year, he got it back automatically, right? Rabbi Hirsch has a whole uh, lengthy explanation how this uh, prevents 
extremes in society, right? The richer get rich and the poor get poor, right? In the Middle Ages, you had the noblemen, the landowners, and you had the poor serfs, the landless, right? And the landless had a field, the, land, the, the, the landowner would buy it for a few pittance and it was his, right, right, right? In our society, that can't happen, right? Now, by the way, until the Jubilee year, if this poor man gets some money, right, or he, uh, his relatives have money, he can redeem his field. And he, can, he only has to pay the same amount the guy paid for it, minus the year's use. In other words, I buy your field, you buy my field for $1,000, and there's 10 years of the Jubilee year, right? You know the Jubilee year is going to come out anyway. It's going to come back to me anyway. So basically what you're doing is you're renting it for 10 years, $100 a year, right? So if, so first of all, it has to stay by the buyer for two years. I can't sell and buy and sell, buy and sell. If I sell my field, the Torah discourages it. You're not supposed to sell your field. So if you do sell your field, it stays by the buyer at least two years. You can't buy it, take it back from that. After two years, if you come up with $800, get it back. After three years, $700. After four years, $600. Right, right, right? right? That means that the buyer will not bargain the lowest price. Because the cheaper the price that he gets, it'll be easier for the guy to buy it back. He wants to keep it as long as possible, he'll make an expensive price, right, right, right? But the opulence and the poverty, right, in our society, after seven years, every 50 years, everything went back to the beginning. No more big landowners, no more poor landless. Everybody got his field back. We started off, went back to, to box one, right, right? It rejuvenates. So this guy who sold himself for a slave, he now goes out and he gets his field back. So he can start all over again. It's a new beginning. It's a rejuvenation of society. It's a tremendous benefit. Instead of the poor getting poorer and the rich getting richer, everybody gets back, gets, starts back, gets back to the, Every 50 years, everything goes back to, 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 to box one, right? That's a tremendous... Uh, that's how Robert Hirsch explains it. Very tremendous thing. And I might think it's a human idea. We thought of that idea, right? Therefore, we blow the chauffeur on Yom Kippur, Right? And we proclaim it's from God. You believe. Jovel. Jovel. From God. God made this thing. Right? And, and, and to show that it's from God, we have another sabbatical year. Right? The 49th year was the 7th year. And the 50th year, you can't plant either. Two years in a row, you can't plant. To show that it's from God. Right? And the 6th year before, we'll make a bumper crop for the next year as well. <laughs> Even today, today's only rabbinical, but all the kippusim that keep shemitah, yeah, they, they always get good crops the year before. This year was a, was a, was a, the year before was actually a, uh, didn't rain, it was a drought, right? But they always have good crops. It's interesting. interesting. All right. Now, what does it mean you can't eat from the fruits? It doesn't mean you have to starve, right? The things that grow up with themselves. So vegetables is problematic because you can, uh, people, you know, you, 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 people won't know when it came from, right, right, right? Vegetables that grow by themselves is a problem. But fruits, right? Fruits that grow by themselves, you're allowed to, you can't show ownership. In other words, you can't, fence your field and not let anybody come in. You have to open up the fence, let anybody come in, even non jews even animals, right, right? Now the owner can take out uh, fruits and put uh, what he needs for his family, right? As long as there's still fruits out in the field. But once there's nothing left in the field, he's got to take out what he has in the house and bring it outside and say, anyone can take it, right? You can take it, you can also take it. You can grab it, you can grab it also, right, right, right? That's called beer, right? We have it today, today. Uh, so, so it's such a difficult uh, just go for one. I, I take. I walk three kilometers to the vineyard. I got there. Nothing left. Then I walk three kilometers to the, to the, to the apple orchard. Uh, nothing left. Right, right, right. So what they did in temple times was the courts appointed someone to be a worker for the court, and he would he would harvest all the fruits that grew by themselves, right? And he would bring them to a marketplace, right? And you would buy it just paying for the labor, not for the fruits itself. You're paying for the labor. The guys that got it down. So today we also have this, right? Carmel wine, right? The uh, the, the, the courts, they give over the vineyard to the courts. The courts appoint workers. Who are the workers? The regular workers in the field, right? To cut the grapes and to make the wine, right? And this wine has to be sold. And they can't sell at the regular price. You buy it very cheap, only for cost. You know, you, uh, all the oats are best means, oats are best in the you can only, uh, it's, it's, you're only paying for the labor. You're not paying for the fruit itself, all right? Now, um, Fruits that grow in a Jewish field. So, so today we have uh, nochri. We have fruits that grow in non-Jewish fields. No, then we get from the Palestinians. We for the fruits that grow in non-Jewish fields. Doesn't have the holiness of shmita. And the chutzlaris that comes out of chutzlaris, hydroponics. There are ways of growing it without without dirt. Um, but fruit that grew on Jewish land has kedushat shviyas, holiness of shviyas, which means you can only eat this fruit in a normal manner. Things that are normally squeezed, such as oranges, you're allowed to squeeze, right? Grapes, you're allowed to squeeze, right? Things that are not normally squeezed, you're not allowed to squeeze, right, 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 right? And you can't, and you have to eat it, you can't waste it. 
can't throw it out, can't waste it. If you have leftover fruits that are still edible, you have to put it in a special bag and wait till it rots. Then you can throw it out. You can't throw it out when it's, when it's still good. Right? Shemitah, uh, uh, a garbage bag is called Pach Shemitah. Right, right? Now, as far as fruits that grew on a non-Jewish field right, in Israel, right, here we have two customs, two opinions. There's an argument. Does that fruit have the holiness of Shemitah or not? The custom in Jerusalem, the Badats, and the custom in Jerusalem was to follow the lenient opinion that if it grows in non-Jewish fruit in fields, you can eat it normally. So the fruits you buy in a store with a hekshav shmita says nachri, nachri, means it grew on non-Jewish fields, and according to the custom in Jerusalem, you can eat it normally. But in B'nai Barak, they follow the custom of the Chazonish. The Chazonish held, followed the opinion that even if it grows on non-Jewish fields, it has the holiness of Shemitah, and you can't waste it, and you can't throw it out until it rots. All these laws apply. Right? So we have two customs in Israel today. Um, yeah, you know, there are spots in the, in the state of Israel that are not in the biblical borders, such as Eilat. Things that grow in Eilat, you're allowed to eat in Shemitah, they, they import from there as well. That's the way of doing it. But in other words, uh, this year you have to be very careful only to buy things that have a hechsher, because this year is Shemitah year, sabbatical year. And when we didn't, and the Torah says, if you don't keep the Shemitah in Yovel, right, then you'll go into exile, and you'll be in the land of your enemies, and then the land will rest its rest, that you didn't get rest when you were upon it. Exile. They're keeping the Shemitah is a prevention of exile. Now, the, 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 this chief rabbinate gets around these laws. How do they get around it? You have to know, for hundreds of years, these laws did not apply. There were no Jews living in Israel doing agriculture, right? But about 100 years ago, when the first settlements began, right, the question came up, what do you do in the Shemitah year, right? In those days, if you didn't plant, they'd starve. It was actually a question of life and death, right? They asked the rabbis in Europe, right? And some rabbis gave an advice, the way to do it was to sell the land to a non-Jew before the Shemitah year, and then it became non-Jewish land. Like we sell the Chumas to a Goy. Now, even then, it was a very big controversy. And the rabbis who permitted it only permitted it temporarily. It wasn't for all times. It was a temporal, temporal, Horat Shah, temporary, right, right? Right, because it's problematic. You're not allowed to sell land to a non-Jew, right, right, right? <laughs> if I sell your chametz for you, right, I'm doing you a favor, right? You're not gonna, you don't have the prohibition of chametz on Pesach, right? But I sell you, if you're, you're not in the religious kibbutz, I sell your land to a non-Jew, I'm breaking prohibition, right? You don't permit me to, right? I'm sure, yes, Arafat would have loved to buy it, right? <laughs> Arafat, right? Anyway, the chief rabbi today still keeps that custom going, and every year they sell the land to a non-Jew, and it's very problematic, right? It's called heter mechira. So you have to look, the words you have to remember when you buy products, if it says heter mechira, it means they sold it to a non-Jew, and, the non, and we, don't, we don't follow that. Most, uh, most Orthodox Jews do not follow that, uh, that, that, that heter, right? Uh, then if it says nachri, or if it says chutz right? Uh, those are the, uh, that's how we get out of it. Another thing about the sabbatical year is that if you owe someone money, if someone owes you money, the sabbatical year takes off all these loans, all loans. And we're coming to Rosh Hashanah, right? This is Rosh Hashanah, the sabbatical year, and then the sabbatical year. All loans that you lent to a Jew come off on Rosh Hashanah. All right, right? What the Torah wanted was that people should pay their debts before Rosh Hashanah. Right, 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 right? But what happened was the poor people got smart. They said, you know, we'll borrow before, uh, before sabbatical year, and sabbatical year comes, we don't have to pay back our debts. Then the rich people got smart and said, you know what, before sabbatical year, no loans, right? Comes the poor guy, don't get, get a loan, right, right, right? So we have Hillel. The conservative movement claims that Hillel was the first conservative rabbi, God forbid, the first conservative rabbi, right? Because he found a loophole, right, right? But that's not really true. Hillel in, inferred from the verses that this law only applies to a private loan, right? But a loan that goes to the court. So the court said, you got to pay this guy money, right? Even though it comes to bad, the, the sabbatical year, it doesn't take it off. you got to pay it. So using that loophole, Hillel devised a document called the Prusbal, which you can write this Prusbal before the sabbatical year begins, before Rosh Hashanah, right? And in this document, you're giving over all your loans to the courts, and now it becomes a court law, and you can collect it after you, right? Now, was he the first conservative rabbi, God forbid? Was he finding a, a whole... Now, what does a loophole mean? What does a loophole mean? Adam, what's a loophole mean? The judge just said they made a law, right? They made a law, and they didn't realize if you do this, this is to get around. Right? Say they put a new, they put this new red light. I don't like this red light, so what do I do? I make a right, left to go around it. Right, 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 right. Uh, loophole means you can find a way out, right? And when the courts figure out, when the legislature figures out there's a loophole, what do they do? They fix it up. They put a fence in, you can't go around. Right, right, right. They say, right, right, right. They didn't realize when they made the law, they didn't realize it. Can there be a loophole in a God-given law? Of course not. God didn't realize it. Of course God realized it. And if there is a loophole, what does that mean? God planned it in advance, right, right? 
In other words, God really wanted people to pay their debts back before the sabbatical year. But he knew the day would come when they would not do it, and the poor guy could not get a loan. Therefore, he left that loophole for Hillel to find, right? right? A similar thing is when it comes to interest. You know, you're not allowed to take interest from a Jew. You're allowed to take interest from a non-Jew, but not interest from a Jew, right, right? Why is that, by the way? You're not allowed to steal a non-Jew. You're not allowed to cheat a non-Jew, right? Because there's nothing per se wrong with lending with interest. Can I rent you my house? Yes. Can I rent you my car? Yes. Then why can't I rent you my money? I got some extra cash, which I can invest to make a profit on it, right? I'm lending it to you. You're going to invest to make a profit on it, right? Isn't it fair I, can, I charge you a percent? It's fair, right? But your brother is different. Your brother needs a loan, right? You're supposed to think, what can I get out of it? What can I get out of it, right? right? You're not supposed to think, he's my brother, you know? This guy would tell me, I believe in the brotherhood of mankind. We're all brothers. I said, well, I understand that, but is your flesh and blood brother or sister close to you than in someone else? No, we're all brothers. Is your fellow Jew closer to you? No, we're all, I don't believe a word you say. <laughs> we believe in the brotherhood of mankind. Aren't we all the children of Adam? Aren't we all the children of Noah, right? We believe in the conservation, the ozone layer, of course, right, right? But first, you got to know what a brother is. You've got to have a special rule. Your flesh and blood brother and sister has to be special to you. And then you can extend it to your fellow Jew. You know, we're all cousins. All Jews are children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're all cousins. We have to love each other, right, right, right. And if you go that far, you can extend it to the mankind. We're all mankind. We are, I feel the brother of mankind. You can feel that too, right? But first, you got to know what a brother is. So you can't lend with an interest. And again, so again, there's a loophole because people have a hard time with this, right? Uh, how do you put money in the bank? So they pay you interest, right, right? So there's, a, there's something called the Heter Mechira. There's a document all banks have in Israel. And then you pay the utilities. If you, over, if, you, if you pay late, you pay interest, right, right? I can't pay interest, right? It's called heter mechira. That, yeah, that means uh, I'm giving you permission, right? To, uh, when, when I lend you money, it's not considered a loan. Rather, it's a joint business venture in which we're sharing the profits and the and 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 the and the and the, and the, and the, and the uh, losses, right? Friend? When you give money to a bank, what do they do with your money? They invest it, right? So I'm making profits on that money. So, so any money that's you know, when the bank pays you interest, that's your that's your share of the profit. When they charge you interest, that's your share of the loss. In other words, so you're not lending money. You're having a, you're having a, a shared. You're making a, a, an investment, and you're both contributing, and then then you and you share the interest and the loss, right? That's how it's called the heterisker. You can do that in the private. I can lend you money with a heterisker, and that way you get interest, right? But the idea is that there cannot be a loophole in the divine law. If there is, it means God put it there in advance. In order to, because he knew that the time's going to come, it's going to be needed. Okay, so we finished book number seven, right? And tomorrow we begin book number eight, the book of Temple Service, Avodah. Any questions? Comments? Arguments? Thank you very much. I rest my case. Okay. Two, we continue.